Ionic bonding is going to be the topic of this lesson, and we'll start off with a little comparison and contrast of ionic and covalent bonding, and, uh, and then we're going to spend a little time talking about what's called lattice energy, which is a, a measure of the strength of an ionic bond. And uh, In this case, we'll talk about the technical definition, uh, but we're also going to talk about how to compare the relative strengths of ionic bonds uh, and ionic compounds, and therefore the relative uh, magnitudes of these lattice energies. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. You'll find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now, this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout this school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. So let's start with ionic bonding here, and we consider ionic bonding the transfer of electrons, whereas we consider covalent bonding the sharing of electrons. Now, we'll see it's not quite so clear-cut. It's not one is transfer and one is sharing. It turns out there's going to be a continuous spectrum, but it's really convenient to kind of go to the extremes and say, you know, complete transfer versus complete sharing. And uh, we'll divide this up a little further, and we'll see uh, that these are actually useful working definitions here. So, uh, but if you look at kind of ionic bonding and the most famous ionic compound of all time, uh, is probably for you and for most of us, NaCl, sodium chloride. And, uh, if you look at sodium, sodium's got one valence electron. And if you look at chlorine, chlorine has got seven valence electrons. And uh, later in this chapter, we're going to learn something called the octet rule, which is going to uh, which we kind of hinted towards earlier when we talked about the, the formulas and, and names of ionic compounds. Uh, but we'll see that sodium's going to lose that valence electron, so he's kind of got a filled octet of the previous shell, and chlorine's going to gain that electron to look like he's got a filled octet of his current shell. Uh, and that transfer of electrons is going to lead to sodium having a positive charge, chlorine to having a negative charge. So, and as a result, you're going to have the attraction of ions now holding them together. And so we have a transfer of electrons from the metal to the non-metal, which then gives you a cation and an anion, which are now attracted to each other, forming this ionic compound. So uh, on the contrast here, we look at covalent bonding as being the sharing of electrons, where we're not really going to have electrons transferred between them uh, in any concrete way or absolute way, but they're going to be sharing them in what we call covalent bonds. And it turns out those covalent bonds really are the shared electrons, or at least are made up of those shared electrons. Now, uh, it turns out if you want to identify whether or not uh, uh, compounds and bonds are ionic versus covalent, got a couple different ways to go about this. And kind of the easiest kind of route, which is not foolproof as we'll see, uh, is the one we've kind of used already in this course, and that's metal with nonmetal. So a metal and a non-metal, we typically are going to identify as an ionic bond. So like, again, sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, and life is good. So whereas on the other hand, if we've got two non-metals, we'll typically identify that as being covalent bonding. Well, it turns out it's a little more complicated than that, and I can come up with a metal and a non-metal that actually would not necessarily be considered an ionic bond. And so, uh, but even so, this is kind of the general rule and the one you should definitely follow. So however, in the last chapter, we learned about something called electronegativity, and we hinted toward the general trend, and we said that fluorine was the most electronegative element on the periodic table, and on the, the Pauling scale, it's got a value of 4.0. And oxygen's the second most electronegative, and on the Pauling scale, he's got a value of 3.5. And after that, we said the closer you get to fluorine on the periodic table, the more electronegative it's going to be. Now, most of you are definitely not going to have to memorize these values on the Pauling scale of electronegativity. Uh, I've on rare occasions seen where that was required to some extent for a few uh, other different elements, but hardly ever over the last 20 years. So most of you are not on the hook. However, you could be provided with a version of the periodic table that has those values listed. And in such cases, they can get a little more technical on the definition of ionic versus covalent. So, and it turns out for ionic, the difference in electronegativity has to be greater than 1.7 or 1.8, depending on the source that you're citing. And I'm going to go with 1.7. So if the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms you are, are of interest here that are bonding together, uh, then it's going to be considered an ionic bond. And that generally is going to happen when you have a metal with a non-metal. So if you look there, sodium has got a value of 0.9. Chlorine's got a value of 3.0. And so 0.9 versus 3.0 is going to be a difference of 2.1, which is greater than 1.7. So anything over 1.7, at that point, we just consider it a complete transfer of electrons. But there really is a continuous spectrum here, 
uh, here, and there's a degree of transfer, if you will. So, but the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the greater the ionic character is going to be. And so, uh, if I give you something like NaCl, and then I compare that to NaF, well, NaF difference in electronegativity again now between 0.9 and now 4.0 is going to be. 3.1 and switch with a much larger difference in electronegativity we'd say that sodium fluoride has a greater ionic character than sodium chloride so that's another thing you should kind of keep and, and take into account as well you may be given you know a question just asking for which of the following has the greatest ionic character well you're just looking for the biggest difference in electronegativity now you're like well chad what if i don't have a table of electronegativities in front of me well that's possible but what they're going to do is give you a comparison uh based on the, the relative trend in electronegativity that you're supposed to know that you're able to figure out. So like, what if I gave you LIF, NAF, KF, RBF, and CSF and said, which of the following has the greatest ionic character? Well, they're all with fluoride, so there's no difference there. But the bigger the difference is going to happen when you've got the lower electronegativity. We know electronegativity increases going up a group. And so again, here's 4.0, largest, highest on the periodic table. So, but cesium is going to be lower than rubidium, rubidium lower than potassium, potassium lower than sodium, sodium lower than lithium. And I'll get the biggest difference when I've got that lowest electronegativity there with cesium. So cesium fluoride would have the greatest ionic character out of those that we listed. All right, now on the covalent side of things, things are a little complicated. Uh, and so it turns out, well, one, anything less than 1.7 is going to be considered covalent. But it turns out they're going to put it into two categories. So, and they're going to break this up into nonpolar covalent and polar covalent. And sometimes we call nonpolar covalent pure covalent. Uh, and the way this works, so here we're going to kind of consider it fairly equal sharing. And this occurs when you've got an electronegativity difference less than 0.5. Some sources will say less than 0.4, but the one I'm citing here is going to go with 0.5, so that's where we're going to go here. Um, on the other hand, polar covalent bonds then would be from 0.5 up to 1.7, because again, once you go past 1.7, it's ionic. So, uh, and what that's going to mean is it's not that the electrons are shared, they're not shared perfectly, if you will. So electronegativity, if we recall from the last chapter, was the ability of an atom to pull the electrons closer to him in a bond, if you will. And so it turns out, uh, once we get to a polar one, that's where we're going to see those partial positive, partial negative charges. Now, how do you recognize nonpolar versus polar? Again, if you don't have a table with all the electronegativity values in front of you. Well, typically the way this is going to work. If you've got two identical atoms, that's going to be generally nonpolar. So if you've got like, you know, fluorine bonded to fluorine, well... Again, fluorine bonded to just about anything else would be considered at the very least polar covalent, if not ionic. Um, but when it's two identical atoms, well, they have the same electronegativity, so it's going to be nonpolar or pure covalent. So the other one you should definitely know, though, is a carbon-hydrogen bond. So notice these are not two identical atoms, but carbon's got a value of 2.5, hydrogen's got a value of 2.1, the difference is 0.4. And again, you're not supposed to remember those numbers, but hydrocarbons uh, and in part of organic molecules and biomolecules, the carbon-hydrogen bond is so common and so important that it's probably one you should definitely know. It has a good chance of showing up for you somewhere along the way. Uh, and so any two identical elements bonded together or carbon to hydrogen, both of those are considered nonpolar covalent. Cool, but the truth is just about any other two different nonmetals that you're likely to see is probably gonna get considered uh, polar covalent at that point. So uh, if I give you like a carbon chlorine bond, well, carbon is again at 2.1, chlorine's at 3.0, and so the difference would be 0 0.9, right in that range. And again, uh, polar covalent here would be anywhere from 0 0.5 to 1.7. Cool, and so you might have to identify ionic versus covalent bonds. Uh, and again, general rule there, again, metal with non-metal ionic, two non-metals covalent, but you might also have to then distinguish between non-polar covalent and polar covalent as well. So now we're gonna spend the rest of this lesson talking about lattice energy. And uh, as I stated in the introduction, lattice energy is a measure of the strength of the ionic bonds. The higher the lattice energy uh, indicates the stronger ionic bonds in an ionic compound. So, so one, we only talk about lattice energy for ionic compounds, uh, but again, stronger ionic bonds, higher lattice energy. So there's a technical definition to lattice energy, and you can show it in the form of an equation, the same way we kind of had a chemical equation for uh, either ionization energy or electron affinity, we'll have one for lattice energy. And so it turns out for lattice energy, you're always going to start with an ionic solid 
and then have it breaking apart into its gaseous ions. And so in this case, we'd break this up into a sodium ion, again, in the gaseous phase, and a chloride ion in the gaseous phase. And the energy change associated with this reaction is what we refer to as lattice energy. Uh, so if you look here, here the ions are bonded together in a solid, here they've been pulled apart into separate gaseous ions. And so again, the stronger the ionic bond that's holding them together, the more endothermic this reaction is going to be. So these lattice energies are typically very highly endothermic. Uh, they're also difficult to measure. We can't really measure them directly uh, in the laboratory and stuff like that. So we have a very indirect way of actually measuring them called the Born-Haber cycle, which is, uh, I'll actually turn that into a very separate lesson that I'll include right after this uh, to go through it. And a lot of you students won't be on the hook for the Born-Haber cycle, but probably at least half of you will. Uh, so you'll find that next lesson where we actually calculate some lattice energies helpful. Okay, so this is your technical definition of lattice energy, and you could again be asked which of the following chemical equations is, you know, describes the lattice energy of, and then fill in the blank of the ionic compound. Well, for NaCl, this is what it would look like. Cool, the other thing you might get though is you might have to do a comparison of the relative strengths of these lattice energies. And there's two big factors that are gonna affect the strength of lattice energy. And one of them is the charge on the ions, and the other is going to be the size of the ions. So it turns out your lattice energy is proportional to the charges over the distance of separation squared. And we'll make it an absolute value here. So, so it turns out the greater the charge on the cation, the greater the absolute value of the charge on the anion. So uh, like a plus two charge ion would have a greater attraction to an anion than a plus one charge. And with a greater attraction, it's going to be a stronger ionic bond, which means it's going to be harder to break, which is why you'd have a higher lattice energy. And the same thing works with the anions. The anions minus two leads to stronger uh, lattice energies and stronger ionic bonds than minus one charged anions and so on and so forth. So the greater the magnitude of the cations and anions plus uh, and minus, the greater the lattice energy. But also it turns out that the ionic bond is stronger when the ions get closer together. So, and that's going to happen when you just simply have smaller ions. That length of the ionic bond is just going to be from nucleus to nucleus. And that distance is going to get shorter when you have smaller ions. And so that's kind of the idea here. So the smaller the ions, the greater the lattice energy as well. And you can see that the lattice energy is inversely proportional to that distance of separation squared. That's what R stands for in this case. And so that's where these come into play. And so it turns out that the charge usually has the greatest impact, usually has the more significant impact, and then the size of the ions, the less significant impact. And so if you are given a handful of ionic compounds and asked to either rank them in order of increasing or decreasing lattice energy, or just pick the one with the highest or lowest lattice energy, the first thing you should look at is charge. Now, if all the charges are the same, then you should move on to looking at the size of the ions. Let's look at a couple of examples. So I'm going to have you indicate the highest lattice energy in a couple different sets of four ionic compounds. And we'll start with this first set. And again, the first thing you should always do in such a, a, a situation is uh, figure out the charge on each of the ions. So in lithium fluoride, lithium is plus one, fluoride is minus one. And notice these are just monatomic ions. And you can tell just based on where they're located on the periodic table. And if we look at sodium fluoride, works the same way, plus one, minus one. Magnesium oxide, notice magnesium is going to be plus two. Oxide is going to be minus two. So, and then for magnesium chloride, magnesium again plus two, chloride just minus one. And we see that if we're looking for the greatest lattice energy, then there is one substance up here with the greatest charges. And he's going to win, therefore. And so the highest lattice energy is going to be MgO here, just based on charge considerations alone. Okay. Now, could I come up with, you know, something that had lower charges that actually had a higher lattice energy? Probably not in this case, but in other cases I possibly could, uh, but instructors, professors, you know, teachers, they know how to avoid that because there's not an easy trend uh, to give you to identify that. So typically one of two situations is going to come. Either one of them is going to have the highest, uh, greatest magnitude charges, like in this case, magnesium oxide, or like we'll see in this one, it's going to be all about the size because the charges are all the same. So in this next comparison here, sodium fluoride, we did that one already. Notice that's plus one and minus one. And notice it's a sodium salt in every case. And I'm just switching out the halogen, which are going to be minus one in every case. 
And so in this case, the charges are all the same. And so the difference is really going to come down to that distance of separation, which again, of second priority is the size of the ions. And the smaller the ions, the greater the lattice energy. And so if I want the highest lattice energy here, then I want to pick the smallest ions. Well, they have sodium all in common. So then it really comes down to the size of fluoride versus chloride versus bromide versus iodide. So, and in this case, fluoride is definitely going to be the smallest being, again, up the periodic table. So with these all having the same charge, we could use the same general trend for atomic radius here. Uh, and fluoride is definitely the smallest, and therefore sodium fluoride is going to have the highest lattice energy out of those four. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you hit that like button? Best thing you can do to make sure YouTube shows this lesson to other students as well. And if you're looking for general chemistry practice on this stuff, if you're looking for quizzes, chapter tests, practice final exams, or final exam rapid reviews if you're uh, prepping for finals, check out my general chemistry master course. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.